Richard Thompson is an artist of not only great talent, but impressive range and inventiveness. He's best known, of course, for the comic strip Cul-de-Sac, which began in 2004 as a Sunday feature in the Washington Post magazine and was nationally syndicated in 2007. A couple of years after that, Richard uh, announced he'd been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. He was named Outstanding Cartoonist of the Year by the National Cartoonist Society in 2010, but in 2012... Uh, he was compelled by his illness to abandon the cul-de-sac strip. Not really much concerned uh, with money or fame, Richard hadn't done a whole lot to promote himself uh, or his work. After his illness was disclosed, the cartoonist community joined to produce a book titled Team Cul-de-sac that honored Richard while also raising money to fight Parkinson's. But much of Richard's earlier work, his illustrations, caricatures, and cartoons had remained unmemorialized uh, in any book. Until now, the art of Richard Thompson captures the extraordinary quality and scope of his work. It's a beautiful book, suitable for any coffee table, uh, with a collection of drawings that, as one reviewer said, quote, would suffice for several lifetimes. It also contains interviews, reflections, and anecdotes by some of Richard's notable peers, several of whom are here this evening. So I'm going to turn things over now to Michael Kavna, uh, who will introduce the others. Michael himself is a writer, hyphen artist, writer, uh, hyphen recovering syndicated cartoonist, or as he has put it, quote, a man of many hyphenates. <laughs> he, he, he now, uh, right, and he now produces the, the Comic Riffs column in the Washington Post and reviews graphic novels for, uh, for the Post. So, Michael, take it away. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, thank you. You know, thank you guys for uh, coming out on a, on a cold night, and hopefully by the end of this we'll have warmed you up a little bit. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I'll ask these guys, and I'll introduce them in a while, uh, sort of, you know, our favorite Richard Thompson stories. And because it's a cold night, I'll tell you one of mine. It, it, uh, it was a night where uh, Stefan Pastis, the Pearls Before Swine cartoonist, was in town. And Stefan's the kind of guy who gives you a call and says, yo, Mike, we're going to Richard's house, and you're driving <laughs> one hour. And so we go out to Richard's house, and Nick is there, and, and Stefan's there, and we're sitting around, and Nick had a big table and uh, just surrounded by Greek food just popping out of nowhere. And it was just a, a warm, friendly night, and Stefan is full of questions. I think he's trying to pick Richard's brain about how you write a joke. And as we're doing this, uh, Richard's wife said, you know, this, the thing about Richard is he cannot write a joke. And we all like, the funniest man in the room cannot. And Richard said, it's true. He said he couldn't write to a punchline. He learned, like life, how to write around it, how to find deeper truths, how to find character truths. And I think that is part of the genius of Richard. When you're looking at how we behave, how we trip in here, or our, how we accidentally almost leave with a novelty book, you know, Richard observes this. And I want to quote somebody. Uh, you know, it's taken all of us, I think, a long time to realize how just how talented Richard is, except for maybe these two gentlemen right here, because he... <laughs> He's a ninja. He's a cartoon ninja. He sneaks up on you. Uh, and suddenly you realize he's produced this body of work worthy of the Library of Congress. Uh, two, two days ago, I interviewed Pete Docter, the Pixar filmmaker, Oscar winner. Uh, he's not much of an emotional guy. He did films like Up, which may be the five greatest minutes of animation with Ellie's song. And here is what, as we talked, he said, Pete's quote to me was, I grew up on comics. I had given up on comics. He said, when Bill Watterson retired, when that sled went off for the last time, he said comics were in a sad state of affairs. A few years later, someone said, hey, check out cul-de-sac. Takes a few months because you're skeptical. He said, after then, he said, I saw it, and I saw in it somebody who did such quality work. He said, not only the drawing, but more important, the writing and the characters. They seem so real and so specific. Here was a man who observes things and can tap childhood that things many of us forgot decades ago. And I think that is part of, of, of it was been said of Mark Twain, he was an enormous noticer. And Richard, uh, in America Day, he's one of our greatest noticers. So uh, I think as, as we look at that, I'll just quickly tell you about my personal journey with Richard. I met him about 10 years ago in the Post. 
He's the he's one of the kind of guys where he lets you talk about yourself first and on and on and on. He compliments me on a panda satire. And then I start following his work, and I'm amazed. And then one day I said, hey, in the Washington Post, would you like to uh, illustrate something? I said, sure. And they come back a week later. We're going to have a runoff with you and another person. It's this guy, Richard Thompson. I said, I'll be happy to edit his work. Here's the assignment. He Then I got a chance several years ago to write a profile of him for the Washington Post magazine. And being around him that much, you realize just what a special guy he is. And uh, the story ran. And the next day, uh, we were on NPR together. And all those many months, I had never seen any sign that cul-de-sac was going to end any day soon. We get in a cab. Richard said, can I go to the newsroom with you? I haven't been to the Post in years. I said, sure. We get in the car. He turns. We're sitting in the back of the cab. He goes to try to buckle. And for the first time, in the whole time around, I start to see handshake. And I just thought, crap, cul-de-sac has ended. And that's the moment I knew we need to start valuing him, what he's done, the level of his talent, and we need to champion him, champion his accomplishment. And thankfully, people like Bill Watterson, who uh, I understand he couldn't be here, but he may have sent along a six-foot rabbit named Harvey, you know, or, or a tiger named Hobbs, but, uh, and Chris Sparks, who also is an editor on the book, couldn't be here. But we have with us uh, three gentlemen who really uh, helped make this book happen and helped make, bring Richard to the world. We have with us Gene Weingarten, Washington Post. <laughs> Editor, columnist, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, you may know him from uh, Fiddler on the Subway or uh, Fiddler in the Subway or, you know, it was Pearls Before Breakfast, right, is the magazine title, which I think you owe two-thirds the rights to Stefan Pastis and one-third to King James for that. Uh, but, in, in, and uh, Gene himself has a new book out, Me and Dog, you and uh, Eric Shansby, right, your illustrator, which is about pets and atheism and spirituality. Is that a good way to <laughs> boil it down? To in 380 <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so God spelled backwards, I guess, is what it boils down to. We have Nick Elephanakis here. Uh, <laughs> besides being one of Richard's oldest and dearest friends, uh, Nick is uh, the illustrator, uh, National Cartoon Society Division Award winning illustrator for the Carolyn Hacks Relationship Column, syndicated by the Washington Post Writers Group. And, uh, you know, and tell me, uh, what's the name? You have the, the funniest single panel book to come out, I would say, in the last eight years. Do you want to tell people what it is? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's called uh, Mike. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'll just say, uh, it, it, on the cover, it has someone who looks a lot like your cousin Zach, on a, and it says, if you loved me, you'd think this was cute, and a couch potato. And we have with us David Apatoff. Will you stand up, David, because you deserve so much of this credit. Uh, David writes the illustration blog, and uh, he has written books about Robert Fassett and uh, Albert Dorn, and, and he is a scholar on illustration in its many forms. Uh, and you're also a lawyer, what, with Arnold and Porter here in town? So uh, you specialize in, I think, mobile communications. So if you get dropped calls, this is also the man to see. Uh, so... But first, I want to say, you know, Team Cul-de-Sac, we found out last year, has raised, counting matching funds from the Michael J. Fox Foundation, has raised, I'm told, more than $200,000 for Parkinson's research, thanks to Team Cul-de-Sac and Richard and these young So please. So, thank you. so let's start off with these questions. And this mic sounds actually better. Um, you know, I, uh, I often like to think... Uh, I almost never hear anyone say bad anything bad about Richard. As abrasive as he is, as much of a narcissist as he is, you know, uh, always thinking about himself. But uh, I, you know, I'm I'm curious. What did you? The first time I met him, he just he 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 was warm and 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 quick and deceptively funny. And I laughed, I, I walked away laughing for days at things that I th reflected back on, almost like his strips. Can you tell me sort of your origin stories with Richard and what it was like when you first met him and what were your first impressions? Because I want to talk about the man before we get to the art. Sure. Do you want to start with Gene? 
Um, Richard is a complete neurotic, um, and uh, it basically it demonstrated itself in in this way. Um, I had seen how good his work was. He had illustrated my column for quite a while. Can you hear this? This okay? Yeah. And uh, I hear you just okay, good. <laughs> And I was the editor of the Sunday Style section, and I decided I was going to make this man an offer he couldn't refuse. And so I took him out to lunch, and I said, um, here's what we're going to do. I'm, I'm going to give you a weekly comic strip, and uh, we're going to call it Richard's Poor Almanac. And you will have no editorial interference. You can do whatever you want, and we will pay you enormously for it. And he said, great, and then disappeared for two years. <laughs> and this is literally true. I had to keep coming back at him, and he was simply terrified at how good an opportunity this was. And some years later, when I was discussing this with Tom Schroeder, he said there was the identical creation myth for cul-de-sac, where Tom met with him, said, we're going to start you on a, um, on a, m a weekly a cartoon. You can do anything you want. We're going to pay you hugely. He said, great. And then two, two years went by. So I just want to point out that on some level where genius lurks, so does nuttiness. <laughs> I will tell the story later about um, uh, the worst mistake I ever made involving Richard. I want to hear that, too. Yeah. This is on? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, before I, and I won't forget, we had, we had a moment of silence uh, for the cartoonists, of course, in France. But how about a moment of non-silence, because we're not going anywhere. Some loud, <laughs> that's right. <clears throat> You hear that? Um, I met Richard uh, in the late 80s. <clears throat> I had uh, visited uh, an animation gallery and was looking at a piece of art and somebody, the, the guy that worked there mentioned that he had, uh, there was an artist that had just looked at the same piece. About my age, maybe I'd like to uh, meet him. Said he was a cartoonist, sure, of course. At the time, I, I had been published down south, and I was making my way back home to sort of conquer bigger mountains and stuff like that, and wanted to sort of search out the community a little bit. I called up this guy, Richard Thompson. We agreed to meet. He walked into the room, the restaurant, and he, Richard doesn't really walk. It's sort of a controlled, you know, lope. And uh, <clears throat> he's about six feet tall and weighed about 40 pounds. <laughs> 30 pounds of it was his nose, you know, 10 was his Adam's apple. And I'm like, wow, so this is my competition. <laughs> and we chit-chatted. I, 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 of course, uh, was more uh, louder and a little more back-slappy. He's a listener. Go figure. And um, Eventually, we got around to these things. We had both showed up with our portfolios, and and I I, I didn't want to destroy this very very nice man's, you know, obviously fragile ego, uh, with my just published work. But you did show first. I showed first, <clears throat> yes. And he was very. He went over every page looking at it, laughing at every, of course he laughed, but I mean, of course he laughed <laughs> at every page. And then, more out of politeness than anything, well, let me see your stuff. And it's a good thing I was wearing diapers. <laughs> we opened that, which is a whole other story, by the way. <clears throat> it was, it, I mean, it, as soon as the portfolio cracked open, so did the sky, and clouds parted, and there were cherubs, and somewhere there was a choir. And as I've said many times, and will say many more times, and that was the creative aha moment of my life, I not only realized that 
um, how long the road was, I realized I was not on the road. <laughs> <clears throat> and from there, um, a, uh, a great and warm and uh, close friendship grew. And I went into accounting. <laughs> and uh, we're all still wearing diapers now. And, uh, you know, part of that, too, Gene, you are, are known for discovering Dave Barry and, and really Richard Thompson. I mean, you championed him uh, before, you know, here in, in D.C., and you got him on the pages. He's reading the book. Uh, I know. <laughs> But uh, I guess my question to you is, can you talk a little bit about what you saw in Dave Barry versus Richard Thompson, and who is more of a diva between these two? No, I won't do that. I, I need to tell you about the worst mistake I ever made. Um, Richard, this was early on, and, and Richard was the guy who illustrated my, cart my, his cartoons illustrated my column, and I decided one week that I would do something just for fun. And th this, this was the bad idea. It was that just for this one week, I would illustrate his column. <laughs> and it would run as my column, but it would be by him with my illustration. And the concept was that something odd would happen. We'd both be pretty smart and funny, but we would be incapable of quite pulling off the specifics of what we had to do because we lacked the 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 individual talent i could not draw and and so he wrote the column and i illustrated it and um as you can imagine my illustration looked like something that was illustrated by a man who would draw a hand with a circle and five spokes coming out of it um and and the column that Richard wrote was better than any column I had ever written. <laughs> and it was at that point that it, I decided we were not going to do this experiment again. <laughs> but I want to read something from that column because it explains, I think, exactly what the genius of, of Richard's writing is. Uh, I think that, that the best writing, I've always told uh, writers that the best writing is in in a story that you're writing is the line that you don't write it's the line that you suggest and you put it in the reader's head and he realizes it and goes aha and in Richard's case what the reader does is is go wait what <laughs> that's the Richard genius and and I'm gonna read you the last line of the column that he wrote um, for me. And uh, what he wrote about was a Thanksgiving dinner that he had at his house where um, basically he got a little silly and broke his toe. That, that, that was the essential storyline. And th this is how he ended it. This may take me a second because that's what I was looking for. I can, while he's looking, I can answer your question yes. about Gene. <clears throat> there are very few people that have the gift of knowing. I can, there's, there's, David Apatoff is one, Joe Procopio is another, uh, and Gene's another who sort of know good when they know what's good when they see it. Dave Barry, Richard Thompson. When my cousin did the first Between Two Ferns, the very first, there was exactly one Between Two Ferns out there. I get an email from Gene saying, This is amazing. This is going to be good. Is he going to do more? And now, of course, it's this comedic institution. It's the number one comedic podcast in the world. Well, Obama's done it. Obama's done it. But he knew then. He knew. I wrote the, f I wrote the introduction to this book. I wrote the introduction to my own collection of cartoons. Both times, I ran those before Gene, before they hit the press. and Because uh, I know that Gene knows, knows. what's good. Okay, so... He breaks his toe. <laughs> he breaks his toe and he finishes the column and this is how it ends. The only downside is that ever since I broke my toe that night, I've been forced to draw with my hands. <laughs> Wait, what? 
that's the genius of this guy. I mean, and I, I on Thanksgiving, the day that book comes out, and it was right around Thanksgiving last year, I reread that. And I'm reading it, and I felt so guilty. I, immense amount, I wanted to go to confession. Because I'm like, this is, this, is, this is gene level. This is gene level. Until I watched the film, we should mention the art, the, the art of Richard Thompson book. I mean, the art of Tom, the, the documentary. And you yourself said, right, this is as good. You said as good as I could have done that week. But it sounds like you're expand. Sounds like you're ex you're you're elevating it even when a little. I told my wife that I, I could not do a better column than that. She yeah. said, "Oh yes, you can." Yeah. And I said, "When have I done it?" <laughs> 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 and then she found something to do in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> the prosecution rests. Yeah. Well, that's well. That speaks to to me the the the, the most genius cartoonists uh, know how to to draw and write equally well. They go you know, if you will, you know, arm and mind. And part of it is, I know people urged Richard when he was slowing down as an artist, they said, just get someone to draw it. And he got some help, but what Richard realized in doing the strip was, he said, the act of drawing it was part of his writing process. His, his drawing hand was in some ways his editor and his character spoke to him when he was drawing him and that would change the, the dialogue. But can, uh, you know, Richard is such a diverse talent, as, as we see. Could each of you talk a little bit more about just Richard as anything but the visuals, as, as a developer of, of character? What, you know, are there, are there favorite characters of, of yours, or favorite things? Is it his ear? What is it about him besides the visuals that makes him so special? It's controlled insanity. And, um, uh, it, you know, th the best way we can talk about Richard here and his writing is to read it. So I'm going to read you something. I'm going to read what I consider a perfect um, Richard's Poor Almanac. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but, but you will get the idea. You're not going to buy the book. We're going to read you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's titled, There's an Opossum in My Garage! <laughs> Exclamation point. And he says, well, don't panic. Opossums are beneficial in many ways. And then he starts writing about opossums. And so you realize, okay, what happened here? There was an opossum in his garage. Now, if I were writing a column about this, um, basically the column would be my attempts to get the opossum out of the garage or whatever. But no, he just starts um, kind of riffing on opossums. And you know he's done some work here. He says, did you know that they're the only marsupial n native to North America? They even predate the dinosaurs. This makes them just insufferable. <laughs> so then, so, so he's taking you on this little journey about opossums, and then suddenly comes this. Opossums in the arts. <laughs> American author Henry James was famous for his collection of stuffed opossums. Of course, it was probably one of those things where somebody once gave him a stuffed opossum, and he feigned enthusiasm just to be nice, <laughs> and then boom, everybody's giving him stuffed opossums until he's heartily sick of the wretched things. Now, when I read this, I asked myself a question. Did Henry James actually have opossums? <laughs> <laughs> the wait, yeah, exactly, the wait, what moment. And I didn't know, so I would like a show of hands ha near, here before we go on. How many of you think that Henry James actually collected stuffed opossums? <laughs> Fewer, I, I'm, I'm one. Okay. No, knowing Richard, he did not. <laughs> that was entirely out of his madcap brain. And then, when you just have no idea where the hell this is going, this is what happens. <laughs> Want to learn more about opossums? <laughs> Come on over to my garage! <laughs> <laughs> but watch your step, there are tent worms all over the place. <laughs> that was just pure genius, start to finish. Uh, I can probably give you a thousand examples of that, just having spent so much time with him over the years. I'll give you two quick ones. Just how his mind uh, 
once we were out to you know at the diner or something like that that was as we have been many many times and I was having a, an allergy I was about to sneeze and it was one of those build up to the sneezes I'm like and there were there were no napkins there was there were you know nothing it was like they were wearing a t-shirt or something like that I'm like and, and you could, I was looking at, and Richard was just looking at me about to <laughs> explode and and he he just like in in an effort to help out he went and he slid a pad of butter towards me. <laughs> I mean, I sneezed and then I laughed for about half an hour. Uh, just two or three weeks ago, uh, we, a uh, couple of us, a few of us, had arranged um, to uh, go to the National Portrait Gallery a little bit of a, a a private show of some of the caric uh, caricature work they have there, and the um, the curator, who is uh, very friendly to us, uh, is a, a very nice woman, very sort of sophisticated, clean cut, you know, uh, tweed dressed woman with perfect hair. Turns out, uh, while we were there, she just she loves edgy humor. There's almost no joke to edgy or obscene or, I mean, really. <laughs> There's there, I can't tell. I did tell, I did tell the joke, but yeah, no. And, uh, and she loved the joke. And so, I mean, this is, a, you know, and so we're relating this to Richard right after since he couldn't join us. And we're telling her about the, the juxtaposition and how she, and, and Richard, who can, doesn't speak much these days, and he just looked up, he went, curators. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we talk about how Richard, there's, there's a slyness to him. There's that twinkle in the eye. Uh, for this film, The Art of Richard Thompson, the short documentary, and I recommend it. Very well done. Uh, one of the filmmakers, I believe his name is Andy Hummendinger. 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 Now, Richard, always noticing his neighborhood, not just the manholes, but the, but the men themselves. And so he puts in a comic. He doesn't ask Andy. He doesn't really know Andy. He just knows Andy's name from the neighborhood, apparently. And he creates a, a neighbor who keeps to himself. And I think it was something like Randy Hemin a thingabobber or something. <laughs> Close enough that if you lived in the neighborhood, you knew he was making fun of. And the point of this comic was he had three or four other neighbors looking at this man saying, I don't trust a man who keeps to himself. And he has four different layers of social commentary about this sort of little male Peyton Place thing playing out here. And the thing is, Andy sees it, and, and someone says, you should check this out. And then he approaches Richard. And then he is part of Richard's circle. Now, Richard didn't seek approval because he just, this was what he was feeling. And there's no malice toward it. It's just him observing and, and being brilliant. Uh, Gene, you, in the book, uh, I think you called this in, insidiously subversive but deceptively charming, is his humor. Is that why you relate to Richard so, uh, is, is com, you know, simpatico? And can you talk about that? Because you talk about your, your what, you know, what you do for the Post. You, you say, the Post management doesn't know about this. You know, it's, it's the subversive. And Richard, there's always a sense that, that Almanac was subversive in a way the editors weren't fully aware of. The, the thing is, I always found myself um, on the same wavelength with, with Richard. And there, I, I want to quote two things that he did. Um, he, the, the, the question that creative people get, particularly creative people in humor get, more than any other, is the one they really hate because there's no answer to it. And, and the question is, where do you get your ideas? And we do not know where we get our ideas. Um, the, the answer that I usually give is, is that the greatest muse uh, is a deadline. And th that, that's just absolutely true. Richard twice addressed this that I know of in his work. And each one was brilliant. Uh, the first was um, something like a 24-panel cartoon on the birth of a, of, a, a, of a funny comic strip. And in each panel, he is getting progressively more insane and empty 
of ideas. And the panel that I simply love, because he's talking about um, the things that he's doing to try to get an idea, and I think it's uh, panel 13 or 14 is Google funny idea. <laughs> <laughs> he tried to address the same question another time, and he did it um, anatomically. He decided that um, the, the place that ideas come from is the idea gland, <laughs> which is in the brain, but no scientist has ever found it, and it is triggered by panic. <laughs> it's exactly right. Richard and I actually had a chat about that, because it's a question that all, I think all creative people get it, uh, you know, at some point, and <clears throat> in a sober moment, he, uh, he said, he said, that he goes, I, I get my ideas exactly where you get your ideas. The, the trick is in recognizing that it's an idea. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I, saw, I saw him reminded me of, there's, a, there's an old book uh, called The 50, 50 Steps of a Master or something like that. It's a book, Dali, teaching people how to paint in 50 steps. Very detailed book, very detailed goes, you know, this, you mix this, you learn how to do that, you glaze this way, and you're going through 49 chapters. The 50th chapter, he summarizes the other, f once you have learned how to mix this and glaze this and compose it, it's this long list, the very end, once you've learned all of this stuff, it will all come to nothing unless you are Dali. <laughs> <laughs> and we can say the same for RT. Right? Exactly. <laughs> Um, you know, and there's a, a, a notion he will admit when we're sitting around your table, you know, there's a sense of Richard is, is sort of the, the Yoda of cartoonists, that he's always in control, beatific. But he admitted to having uh, that uh, sort of perfectionist's temperament, that it, it shocked. A past us looked like he was going to fall out of his chair when when Richard admitted that he had, I believe, kicked his leg, maybe with that same broken toe, through a wicker chair because he couldn't get a line right. The, I mean, this is for all for for the warmth, the quick wit. I mean, this is this is an, a modern American master of of in in several media, and I mean, he labored. He has he would mix his own paints, right? He have seen in his studio. He's he's an alchemist of, of tints. I mean, here is someone for all for. We tend be with the, we put the cartoonist label before it, and I think you know, as opposed to being uh, saying a great painter, Richard, I believe, could have gone into almost any field of art and only so many wicker chairs would have been damaged in the process. But can you talk to, to, I mean, here's someone who, it's easy to say just cul-de-sac or just poor almanac, but this is a man of enormous breadth. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll switch it up with you. <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm not using a pun when I say uh, Richard sort of drew the line in his studio. Inside of his studio, on a drawing board, he held himself to uh, and, and by drawing board, I'm also talking about r his ideas and writing and the concepts, but he held himself to an ab absurd standard. Uh, I can tell you for 26 years that this guy's waste paper basket, almost every bit of it is frameable. But he saw something that we didn't see, and he would not compromise. He would not settle for less at all. Uh, in the book, there's a page uh, that has uh, a whole bunch of Brahms. And what, what Richard would do often uh, later on when he learned his way of using a light table is he would do a drawing. He was happy with the sketch, just the idea it sent him in the right direction. Then he would put a piece of paper over that on a light table. He would never trace when pencil the new thing and then ink it. He would go right to ink. And the reason that he did that was to keep it fresh and alive and because, as he said, he liked the certainty of accidents. <clears throat> but he had to be happy with the final product as well. In research for the book, I found 17 of these Brahms. All of them are amazing. None of them were good enough. He wouldn't settle for less. He just had this bar where he measured himself against himself. 
That said, when he stepped out of the studio, he just shrugged his shoulders at everything. Everything. He'd hang out with anybody. He didn't care about money. He dressed in a plaid shirt and jeans, probably from the moment he was born, and that's what he's wearing right this minute. He just sort of, you know, it was so easy, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Um, if Richard Thompson is the only person in the world that you know, then you have no way of knowing whether or not you're an asshole. <laughs> I want to add only one thing. Um, if you want to see the, um, the degree of perfection that, that he works with, the best way to do it is to look at his caricatures. And if you have the book, look at page 134 and his caricature of Beethoven. And try to imagine how many versions of that he must have done before he got it perfect. Yeah, tell us. I found all the versions of <laughs> Beethoven. <coughs> yeah. The, the first one is almost a portrait, slight distortion. And then he pushed it. And you could see in the margins of these little tracing paper, you, you know, you start seeing the, the final one coming too. What I didn't know is that he had done a color one like this as a, of a finished product. It's just like, but it had purple hair and a green jacket and he didn't, it was beautiful, it was amazing. Never saw it, it was on the bottom of a box covered by the things that you stick in a box over the course of a decade. And um, this was the one, Richard, by the way, he knows this Beethoven is good. Um, he's, 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 a gentle, he's a gentle person and he is a modest person, but he also knows He's uh, not an all shucks, you know, he, he, you'll hold up something to him and he'll, and he'll say, uh, yeah, I like that. He knows. There are other things that he just stares at and I'm like, no, that, I don't like that. But he's honest about his stuff and he, he knows. That Beethoven won an award and uh, was dis on display in Los Angeles and was stolen. And it absolutely crushed Richard. That's how you know he liked it. And it was like stolen off. It was stolen. It was it disappeared. And he redrew it. He did another one. Uh, it was slightly larger from memory, basically because he had done all those sketches. <clears throat> and um, it is the most amazing Beethoven you've ever seen, but for the fact that that one existed. And it is indeed better. So the one he did when this one was stolen is in his bedroom. Two years after it was stolen, it was miraculously and anonymously returned. What a great story. That's, yeah. That's great. So which one of his asshole friends stole it? <laughs> so uh, we have time for an extended time for a question and answer. And let's open it up. We're, these, these gentlemen can tell you, and, and David Appet up too, about Richard the Man, Richard the Talent, uh, this array, decades of art, uh, you know, anything you want to throw at them. Let's, let's go at it. Yes? Can you just remind them, if, if you can, to go to the microphone? Oh, there's Do a micro we, oh. there? we have a microphone right here, and what, we're in right here? So you can just line up behind them. I'm wondering how he squares the panic of deadline with the perfection element. In other words, he's working on deadline. Did that make the perfection happen? What, is your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, <coughs> you know, who answers that in the, in the uh, yeah, if I can find this. In your hymnals, please turn. <laughs> uh, yeah, Richard, uh, Gene, is, Gene is looking up for, uh, to quote Richard, and I'll tell you in, in the meantime, uh, you know, he, uh, he had an assignment for many, many years in U.S. News and World Report where he did a caricature for Washington Whispers. He got the assignment on Thursday afternoon. Um, I know this because on the very few, very few times he'd go on holiday or something like that, they would call me to, to fill in. He got it on Thursday afternoon, had to turn in a sketch, uh, basically the, the basic idea, a few hours later, and then he had to finish the thing by morning. It was an all-nighter every week for many, many years. And he would pace around, he would, you know, say he might call. And when he called, uh, you know, it's like he's got all the time in the world. 
but he uh you ne- he needed that he needed that if that if that deadline were three days later it was he would have still taken it right up to that he had an open deadline with Rostropovich who comes up every once in a while the National Symphon- Symphony uh, conductor and uh, and uh, cello player they said whenever you want I think it was eight years <laughs> later I'm not I'm not kidding and probably 8,000 drawings he finally uh, came up with a final Okay, and, and as I said, he really did answer your question in, in this strip called Drawing a Funny Cartoon in 20 Easy Steps. And, you know, you wanted to know, was it really the last step? Well, he... Page. Oh, uh, page 37. And um, basically, he's got it divided into 20 little, uh, little panels. And uh, panel number two says, try random thoughts. And he's thinking this, that, and the other. Then more random, and he's thinking truth, Beauty, bus exhaust, the vermiform appendix. <laughs> then he takes a break, then he thinks some more, then he deals with Gary Larson and Roz Chast. He grinds his teeth, he's now up to n- number eight. Then he, then he suddenly finds himself in the middle of a shoots and ladders game. <laughs> he hallucinates, he stares, he uses his third eye, a third eye pops up in his head. Then he Googles funny idea. Then he looks up, and it's number 16, and he's thinking, step 16 already? (laughs) 17, he reaches creative nadir, and his head explodes. (laughs) On 18, it says, only two steps left. And then on 19, draw a funny cartoon. And 20 says, thank God for deadlines. (laughs) That is... uh Richard was actually supposed to be here tonight, but we told him just show up whenever you'd like. <laughs> so we'll see him in March. Um, Hi. Um, I read, the, um, Nick, I read your introduction and I um, really enjoyed it. And I thought one of the, oh, I'm sorry. Um, one of the ironies I thought was is that so um, everyone with the book seems to have come at it through his work, through his cartoons. And, but you as a cartoonist, at least through your introduction, um, seems to have come at it through friendship, and I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. We, we met uh, because of similar interests all those years ago when we were starting out, and uh, uh, a, friendship, uh, a friendship grew, and when I, think of, um, when I think of Richard, the first thing, art does not pop into my mind first at all. Um, you know, I, my brother is a a, a, re, a neuroscientist, and when I think of my brother, a m- million things pop into my head before I think of neuroscience, and that's how it is with Richard. You know, I um, we spent a lot of time together, a lot of quiet time. You know, it's the kind of friendship uh, as you, I'm sure you all have <clears throat> um, friendship like this, with maybe the possible exception of Kevin Reckin, uh, where you have uh, you know close proximity. You just hang out, and it just, it's calming, like with a dog. It's just, <laughs> it's calming. When I think of Richard, I think of uh, us being on the subway and him swinging on a, a pole, just holding it and swinging around, a huge smile on his face. Um, we were going to a museum, and I just asked him to stand with me at my wedding. Um, and I think of Richard, I remember being in the waiting room uh, with him when uh, his uh, first child, Emma, was going to be born. And there's a couple of reasons I remember that moment. is It's the first and se- the only time that Richard has ever mentioned money or shown any concern about money or finance. Because he suddenly just looked at me and his eyes grew wide and he said, I need to make some money, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then, as David Avatov can tell you, he proceeded to turn down all of the highest paying jobs in the industry. Um, so, yeah, we're, uh, we're pals. I mean, um, he, well, he, uh, this, is, this is touched on in the book. Um, I had been in Greece for a long time. I go, when I go, I go for months. And we stay in touch through email, of course, then. And the emails got farther and farther apart uncharacteristically. And then I came back. And I don't live that far away. And I'm like, hey, I'm back. Let's get together. Two-day response to, for him to respond. That's unusual. He goes, I, I, I'm on deadline. I can't. That's it. 
no welcome back, no, no. And then I was, okay, fine. This went on for a little while. Suddenly I'd been in the country for like four months or so and had not seen Richard. And I went to our favorite diner and there he was, was there with his whole family. And I saw him and I thought he had had a stroke. His arm was hanging and he, as I've described earlier, is a thin guy, he didn't have any weight to lose and he had lost a lot of weight. And so, um, you know, at that point you don't, I'm not thinking art or cartoons or his deadlines or anything, you know, he's your buddy. So quickly arranged to um, have a doctor friend come over to the house, had, had him over like 48 hours later. And uh, she, the doctor was there and she, um, she gave him a, a diagnosis right there in the living room examination I should say and and said I think you have Parkinson's and uh, and uh, so these are things that leap to mind more than uh, this book but this these things are the fuel to go through with the book and uh, and and uh, and get it out there because besides being my friend he happens to be probably the greatest living cartoonist very well said. And they wouldn't say it for themselves, but I, I will say that friends like Nick and, and Mike Rohde and others, are so cl being so close to, to Richard, um, they're there for him. They're there for him, you know, day after day, week after week, doing the kinds of things that, that friends do through Richard's journey. So no matter how many pats of butter he slides your way, you are there for him uh, constantly. And, and, you know, I talk to other people and they, and they say it means it, it you know it, it, it means so much I will I do want to point out by the way in writing this profile of, of Richard uh, speaking of Greece it turns out the 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 there were three people hard to really pin down to really get their full thoughts and part of it is there's so much to say but I'd say one of those was was Nick because he had so much insight and often you were in Greece and uh, the post would only pay so much for those phone calls Second was Bill Watterson, and when you're trying to reach someone and they've been on the Times list of 10 most reclusive people on the planet, and you start getting emails from them, and then multiple emails, and then you realize the toughest person to pin down is Richard, because I wouldn't get him, and then I'd get an email, and it would be so such a brilliant answer, I'd go back and rewrite my lead, and then I'd get something three weeks later, and it was more brilliant. And I could tell he'd spent so much time thinking about how he wanted to, not communicate, but sort of how he wanted us to perceive him, even through that, that filter of, of humor. There was always truth under that. So that's him. Yeah, did you please? Um, hello. So I know you mentioned that Richard Thompson, when he went outside, he shrugged a lot of things off. When he was in a studio, of course, he held himself to a very high standard. But when he was outside, you know, he let a lot of things go. He was a pretty, he seems kind of like an easygoing guy. How did he respond to the level of fame? I know he won a Rubin in 2010. How did he respond to the level of fame he achieved throughout his career? Well, he certainly didn't achieve the level of fame that he equates with his level of talent. Um, Richard never pursued, uh, he ne actually, can I pull you up here to answer that, David? Because you, 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 uh, this is David Apatoff, my co author. I, I would say that Richard is probably the best kept secret in American illustration today. The people, the Cognizanti in New York and in Hollywood, the top people in, in, uh, in Europe, they know who he is, but he isn't the household name the way that uh, he should be. And this book is designed to correct that. One of the reasons for that is that Richard is the most unambitious, self-effacing kind of guy you'd ever meet. And my first encounter with him was when he was at a table selling his books. And I asked him which one I should get. And he said, well, you don't want that one because the <laughs> reproduction is really very good on that one. And you don't want that one either because, you know, a lot of repetition in that one. And he went online and talked me out of every book that he was selling. And, and that's Richard. So, uh, you know, it's not as if he was uh, caught up in his reputation. Uh, he was shamefully oblivious to it. And it's his, his friends who recognize his talent and, and gathered around him who are uh, fixing that right now. Gene, yeah. I'm curious, do you want to speak, uh, did you ever feel like you needed to champion him? And in, in, in you did, but even more so, I mean, 
did, did you feel like I need to take steps to use my platform to help more people see Richard? Y yeah, but as I said, he, he kind of subverted that. You know, th there would have been a, a Richard's Poor Almanac two years before it actually happened. I, he just, you know, this wasn't about fame for him. And there's one thing I ought to say that's, that's obvious, but um, uh, I should say it. Bill Watterson declared this man a genius. And y you can't get better praise than that. Um, you know, when it, it didn't surprise me, but it shocked me because Bill Watterson is a guy who never wanted to be heard, um, never wanted to step out into the, into the limelight, never wanted to be interviewed. I once learned where he lived. This goes back many, many years. Uh, I think it was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and I flew out there without any warning because I knew that if I'd said I wanted to talk to him, um, he would, you know, he would have said no. And I went out to Cedar Rapids. I didn't go to his house because I knew that that would drive him nuts. So I went to his parents' house. <laughs> and I gave them a note to deliver to Bill Watterson along with a gift. And the note said, Bill, I want to interview you for the Washington Post. I'm going to be staying in this hotel at this number and I'm not going to leave until you call. And a full day went by. And then I got a call from the head of his syndicate to say he wouldn't be talking to me. <laughs> the reason I mention this is twofold. The first is that in this book, Bill Watterson signed, you know, all, everybody involved in the book signed a copy for everybody else. And Watterson's inscription to me says, Gene, get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> But the real reason I'm mentioning this is that the genius of Richard Thompson brought Watterson out into the open, and that is just awesome. When, when, when Watterson, Watterson sent Richard an email praising cul-de-sac, Richard sent it to me, and I wrote back right away. I said, all the, all the awards you've gotten and will get, then it was still will get, uh, will not equal uh, this. Uh, to, to further answer the young man's question, Richard is one of the only cartoonists to win uh, two Rubens in one year. I think that's only happened. The division award. Yeah, to win two division, but not not many cartoon like no. two or three. I think. Yeah. yeah, right. Only two or three have ever done that. But this is how that happened. He he just there were some tear sheets lying around his studio, and he's just like, I say I should you know maybe submit something. Yeah, I don't know what to submit, and I didn't even pay attention. I was right. I said, yeah, this one over here for that category, and these over here for that category, because you're picking from gold no matter which way you go. He won both categories. He won an award, the Perot, which I think comes up here. There's a Perot coming out of a gopher hole. You guys have seen. <laughs> That got into the Society of Illustrators. And that was a very big deal. The Society of Illustrators annual. And, but you had to do this thing. You had to fill out the paperwork and you had to have a print made of it and you send that you know, in. And there was a little bit of... And he's like, yeah, I got to do that. He never did it. So they ran a reproduction of the newspaper cover. He just... He just uh, he had another drawing or concept on his mind. And all of the bells and whistles and flash that could have come with it just didn't interest him then. And I should point out, it's not just, there are certain cartoonists where other cartoonists say, yeah, he's great, or she's great. And they're like, yeah, yeah I admire them as a fellow colleague. Uh, some of us were at Richard's house a few months back when Rick Kirkman, the artist for Baby Blues, was in town. And he wanted to make a pilgrimage to see Richard. And as we were walking in Richard's studio, Rick said, I have a secret to tell you, Richard. And he said, sometimes when I'm stuck or feeling uninspired, I look at Richard's poor almanac and I just bask in it like inspirational bathwater and I get inspired. 
What he's saying is you're someone we, we, we go to. And I've talked to Matt Worker, the cartoonist at Politico, and he says, if my line is getting stiff, almost sort of this uh, rigor mortis of, of the hand that comes from not loosening up, he said, I look at Richard's precisely loose work and it loosens me up. That's what we're talking about, we're saying with the cognoscenti. And yet I will say, there was a top New Yorker cartoonist in writing the profile, I said, I'd, I'd love to talk to you about Richard Thompson. Do you like his work? Huge fan, she said, huge fan. I said, what would you like to say? He said, well, I like his, him on the 12 string guitar more than the six string guitar. <laughs> I thought, how is this possible? She now knows who he is. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. To, to follow, you reminded me of something. This should have been in the book. <laughs> there were some things that, because you know, it sort of speaks to this, I was sitting in, uh, many, many, many years ago, I was sitting in an airport, I won't identify the airport or the cartoonist, but it was a Pulitzer Prize winner, who, I open up the editorial page, I may have told you, David, I open up the editorial page, and he had traced a Richard Thompson caricature of Senator Graham, the caricature's in the book, but he had traced it. And so I brought the paper to Richard. And I said, you know, I just went, you know, opened it up. And Richard looked at it, he went, whoa. He was very, he always has this sort of innocent, childlike quality about him. And then uh, we chatted for a little while, we moved on to something else, eventually you were grabbing, and then he finally looked at me and he was, I'd never seen him like this before, he was flush. And he says, I'm, he says, I'm mad. <laughs> and contacted contacted the newspaper, major newspaper, wow. two-time Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist. Uh, so yeah, so he did. There was something there that said, uh, "Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm Richard Thompson." Wow. Yeah, but when you're getting paid for it, two-time Pulitzer winner, we could figure out here in this room. <laughs> there's not many. I could be wrong. There's not. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> It was Gene for replacement week, so we excused it. Yeah, please. Um, first of all, I, w I want to thank you guys for doing this because it's great. Please. Been a huge fan. David. I don't have a question as much as a little story to tell about Richard. Um, well, I came into contact, you know, like putting his, helping put his cartoons, sizing them, or putting in the paper at some point a long time ago when my younger son was just about bar mitzvah age and he was drawing a lot, cartooning, nothing serious. And so I had the, you know, balls to say to Richard, hey, if I, you know, for like a bar mitzvah present, if I, you know, tell me what amount of money it would cost me to have my son come to your house for like a month of, you know, once a week or whatever, just sit with him, just let him, let him see what you do, whatever, you know. He thought about it. He thought about it for about two weeks. And he got back to me and he said, I don't want any money, um, but I want to see what he does. So I brought him a couple of things. And then I think for maybe six weeks in a row, he entertained my son. Um, so I got to go into the studio, which I was like agog. You know, I think I saw that they told him. And, and he, you know, I, I would be so, you know, like I had to leave the sanctum. I couldn't stand there and be a stage mother or anything. So I, after the session, I would come to pick my son up and we'd get in the car. I'm like, what did you do? What did you say? What did you draw? What did he say? You know, and he's like, he told me really not to say much about it. <laughs> <laughs> but you could see the influence in his line and he really did draw for years and years and years after that. And it was, you know, it was priceless for me and for Will. That's a great story. That's amazing. Next, please. Mr. Shansby. Yes. Hello. Um, this is Gene's artist. I think we should applaud him. Andrew Chansby, ladies and gentlemen. Who is, he literally had to fill Richard's shoes as Gene's artist. So those are big shoes to fill, but fortunately you have artistically big feet. A so. poor substitute. Um, but. I, I just wanted to ask, I've heard like sort of pieces of the story, but I wanted to ask you guys, and maybe Nick, you know the answer to this. What was the actual chain of events that resulted in, in Bill Watterson coming, you know, out of complete obscurity and then, you know, writing a forward to cul-de-sac, just, you know, being present? Like Bill, Bill Watterson's mother came and said, could Bill Watterson come <laughs> once a week? 
little belated bar mitzvah thing. I thought that might be. He, <laughs> there are some things he hasn't learned yet. And Richard told us, don't talk about it. You've been to a bris, right? Oh. <laughs> the, 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 the broad strokes are that um, uh, Richard had a, he's actually a friend of ours, a fellow by the name of Rich West. Um, who was a cartoon historian and used to have a publication called Target. And Rich, uh, Rich and Richard and I would gather, we gathered rather uh, frequently over the years. Just so happens that Rich and um, Bill Watterson were college roommates and are still great pals and great, great friends. Um, so much so that Rich would come back from a big, wouldn't say anything, and he would just give us these uh, Calvin and Hobbes books signed to us. And this was actually when Calvin and Hobbes was still running. <clears throat> um, so Rich, you know, fast forward years later, and uh, Richard's doing cul-de-sac. And so Rich, of course, showed cul-de-sac. He finally showed it to um, Bill. And as we went into earlier, Bill just suddenly, he just came out and made, made the comment, made the statement. Um, um, and so uh, around, around then, um, Chris Sparks, who was, uh, to say he's a fanboy is, um, yeah. Uh, he's like, you've seen videos of puppies just indiscriminately running up to you, know, wanting up with the tongue hanging out and all of that stuff. That's, ri that's, that's Chris. Uh, and so um, he had family in Ohio and he had uh, asked a cartoonist, Stefan Pastis was the first major cartoonist that he asked to contribute to this thing called Team Cul-de-Sac. And when Stefan did, the dominoes toppled. Uh, it, it, gave the, it gave the effort some credibility, and other cartoonists lined up, and then very, very quietly through the syndicate, through Lee Salem, uh, who was then still head of uh, Universal Press, contacted Watterson. Watterson is now officially on record as Richard's and a, a huge admirer. So he contributed a piece. And so that led to introductions and, and things of that nature. Um, and it led to Bill leaving Ohio. Sorry, it's not Iowa. Um, sorry, Bill. I should have said it was Iowa. <laughs> um, and uh, this very, very private man. How private? I picked him up when he arrived. There's a picture of him on the internet from 1985. <laughs> and I picked him up and we didn't say hello. I said, well, you haven't changed much. And he responded, 30 years ago, I couldn't anticipate the internet. <laughs> Does he still have the mustache? He had one in that picture. Oh, yeah. No comment about yeah. facial <laughs> or back hair. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, then, the, then, like I said, to say that, oh, there should be a book, The Art of Richard Thompson, is like, it's like looking at, uh, you know, if a, some 18-year-old kid walks in here and he's 300 pounds and, and muscular, and you're like saying, oh, you should play football. And it's fairly obvious. The, the first person that I remember having been around was Bono right here. Should give a round of applause, Bono Mitchell. Yeah. Bono Mitchell. <laughs> Bono hired him relentlessly for years and years and years for all of these. He was cheap and he was good. Right. And didn't you say you, he started cul de sac so he could he get away from her? Yeah. Exactly. In fact, there are, a, there are a couple of people here associated with it. The co-editor, Michael Rohde, Mike Rohde who's Tom texting. <laughs> that, uh, 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 then there's uh, Britt Connolly, who scanned and imaged most of the work in the book, which is why it looks so damn good. Uh, Steve, Connolly too? Steve Connolly's not here. He's the book designer. Uh, and he did a great job of uh, not shooting himself in the face. Um, and then uh, Kevin Reckon is back over here. Uh, he informally uh, uh, 
he's, he's a, Kevin's a great cartoonist and he went through the images and, and, and gave us his thoughts and he also he had weighed in heavily on the, on the cover. Um, so uh, yeah, we all sort of, uh, you know, a, a labor of love often it was labor, uh, but much more often it was love. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Eric? Yes, it does. Okay, great. We have time for one more question. So, if anyone, Bueller, Bueller, <laughs> <laughs> anyone? Um, yeah. Well, I just I want to say, you know, I hope Richard. He's in the neighborhood. I hope you all will get a chance if you haven't to meet him because. He's a, he's a special man, and uh, besides being a special talent, and it's just we all should should appreciate him because, you know, Bill Watterson is telling us to. And please, but he, he loves company. Richard loves company and coffee milkshakes. You know, if you show up with a coffee milkshake and your child, you may not see your child for a month. Um, don't tweet that. That could come out wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't talk about this, shh, don't tell. Um, but anyway, I just please give a huge round of applause for these gentlemen who put this book together for you. Nick Galifianakis, Gene Weingarten, Mike Rohde, David Apatow, and thank you for coming out.